Hello, I'm Kat Sarkis, Forever Bookseller at Barnes & Noble. Today we are joined by the lovely Ursula Vernon, also known as T. Kingfisher. Uh, Ursula writes fantasy, horror, and occasional oddities, and has won numerous awards for her work uh, in various mediums, including the Hugo and Nebula. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, delighted to be here. Uh, it's it's any day that I get to talk books with, with booksellers is a great day. So for me, personally, um, I... Uh, first came to your writing as a children's author, only to discover uh, that you also write and uh, illustrate a variety of other genres and mediums. And so I read, you often say that inside every children's book author is a horror <laughs> author. Just a very frustrated waiting, horror waiting author. Waiting <laughs> to come out. So I, I'm going to need you to elaborate on that one a little bit. <laughs> Well, uh, the thing is that in when you're writing a children's book, uh, first of all, it, it shares much uh, uh, relation with horror because it has to be usually very immediate and very uh, visceral and gripping because otherwise the kids are going to get bored. Yep. And uh, the, the, your, your window of opportunity to grab the reader is, uh, is some, I mean, you have longer with horror, you can do the slow creeping dread better, but there is still a, uh, y you have to grab uh, the reader, you know, uh, metaphorically by the throat. I do not, I do not condone grabbing children by the throat. That is <laughs> bad. Don't do that. Or adults. Let's just not go around grabbing anyone. By the throat, <laughs> but also when you're a, a, a children's book author or, okay, maybe this isn't true for everyone, but certainly for me, there is, uh, there are points where I'm like, kids would love this and the editor is like they might but their parents won't and they buy the book or no that is too scary or no that is too creepy or no we are not allowed to teach the children that arson is a solution to their problems uh which may be why several of my horror novels have ended with burning down the haunted house and the problem is that every time you are or at least every time i am told that you cannot do this thing in a book it, it goes into this place in your chest and becomes compressed down tighter and tighter until it is like diamond. And finally, you're like, oh, no, I'm I'm going to write something and I'm going to put everything in that they would not allow me to put in and just, you know, go completely hog wild. Many, many children's book authors I know have a, a sort of mental file of the things they could not get away with. And someday they are going to uh, to put that in the book. I think it's just that curiosity. I mean, the things that like kids are kids are creepy. And I say this lovingly, um, but I can't tell you how many times my son has come to me and, and you know, and he's he'll be five and just the things he says. And I don't you don't want to curb that curiosity and that imagination. And so you kind of have to go mm -hmm, like and, and try. <laughs> your best to sort of, you know, answer their questions, explore that macabre side of them. And again, they're just curious. Um, but it's just so funny because I, I feel like, you know, Maurice Sendak has said similar things about, about his writing and just, you know, you put people have put me in children's boxes, but I write what I write. And this is, you know, and children, I don't think we need to be so precious. So it was, um, how just, many how many kids do you know were uh, like uh, uh, certainly among writers all have like, the formative experience where they were twelve and picked up a Stephen King book? Oh yeah. What kids actually want to read and what adults uh, tell ourselves they want to read are often at odds. But yes. uh, I could do like forty five minutes on that. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So we sort of have this sort of retellings and. Uh, reimaginings around, uh, you know, fairy tales and mythology and folklore and now classics. Um, so very much you know, on trend across, I would say across all ages. So you've explored fairy tales um, oh, yes. before in Fire and Eve Moses, you've got the Raven and the Reindeer and, and uh, most recently um, Nedlin Bone, which I know is not, not like truly a, a retelling, but it's very much captures sort of fairy tale, the sort of fairy tale vibe. Oh, I'm so glad it does, because since it isn't quite strictly a retelling of anything, I, it was just adjacent. Getting yes. that, that feel down was very important to me. Yes. So we should we should say, you know, retellings, reimaginings, and like theory and adjacents. adjacents. <laughs> yeah. So for many of us, you know, those those are sort of our first brush. That's sort of our first brush with, you know, fiction and, and fantasy. And what is it about these sort of these stories that kind of that that like they never leave us and they just that we're instantly attracted to them, whether we're 
12 years old or whether we're, you know, 112. <laughs> It's hard to say. I, I think that uh, uh, part of it is is obviously early exposure uh, mm -hmm. and and sort of the cultural gestalt. But there's also so many fairy tales that are very similar and consistent across cultures that you know a a bluebeard is uh, bluebeard in in France and then is uh, a woman who marries a tiger in India, but they're the same basic uh -huh. story and uh, uh folklorists have done uh, extraordinary amounts cataloging them all and there's the arn thompson folklore index that uh, that categorizes them all neatly and if you ever have you know a couple of hours to kill or weeks <laughs> or days or happen to be working late at the streetlight outage hotline in order to pay the bills and no one else is there in the building so you pull up the website not that that's taken from life or anything uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's there's a commonality. There's a a I don't know. There's some kind of resonance on some in some of them with some sort of deep human story. That it, it's as if we we fall into uh, a number of story patterns and uh -huh. the the archetypes keep reappearing. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Penguin Random House published a set of uh, uh sort of lost fairy tales essentially mm -hmm. um the turnip princess was the title and it was uh, hundreds of of lost uh, of fairy tales that had been collected in i want to say germany and never uh widely published by the brothers grammar whoever frankly a lot of them were not well written uh <laughs> i'll be honest there was a reason a lot of them did not come out yes uh, there's a reason there's a reason why they were never resurfaced yeah, yeah but over and over again, they were uh, they were variations on these themes, and and these same you know things which on occasion some of them were were had uh, like, would be like okay this is a fairly so so retelling, but then would have some element that is just like so badass. Uh, there was one that was a version of Beauty and the Beast, which incidentally, is, if you read the original French version um, or a translation of that, that is wow that yeah uh, it's really long and mostly about french uh fairy politics and uh it is it is a thing beauty has trained monkey butlers there's a, a version of that in the the turtle princess book where uh and, and it's all basically cupid and psyche reskinned but uh the the beast is a crow and he pulls out one of his quills uh, or one of his feathers and gives it to beauty and says anything you write down with this quill will be given to you and i'm like damn that's good like the that rest is of the good. story is generic but god <laughs> that's that's a good bit oh man so that's gonna move me into into my most recent favorite uh so this brings me <laughs> not to, a fairy tale yeah <laughs> yeah not necessarily a fairy tale but um to bring me to move what moves the dead uh which is sort of this gripping atmosphere retelling of Edgar Allan Poe's The How, uh, the Fall of the House of Usher. Um, so then we're going from fairy tales. Now we've got gothic classics. What brings you, what brought you to this? Like what brought you to the, to the gothics? I've always loved gothics. I've always wanted to write a gothic. Uh, I still kind of want to write a, a gothic that is not uh, one of the classic gothics where it's the heroine who is trapped in the house and cannot leave because she, she'll, you know, she's penniless and working as, as a librarian or something or organizing the collection. <laughs> and yeah, no, I, I'm going to write that book. And then, of course, there's a dark secret in the brooding house. And yeah. if I write it, probably lots of taxidermy. With Poe, I was I actually got there sort of sideways. My previous two horror novels were uh, pulp retellings, essentially. Yeah. They were uh, Arthur Mason's The White People and uh, uh, Algernon Blackwood's The Willows. And so in my head... House of Usher was just another I am retelling a pulp horror story kind of thing. And I was out, you know, I was one day, what story should I poke at? And I was just reading some classics in the genre. I don't know why some of them speak to me and some don't. Uh, it's just occasionally if one like sticks with me, then usually it's one that I find I need to write something about. Uh, and I have read a lot of pulp and uh, and much of it is forgettable. But then like you get to the willows and it's just there's something there. Yeah. and. Uh, Poe, uh, actually, it wasn't so much there was something there as I was exasperated. I, I was like, I haven't read Fall of the House of Usher since I was a weird nine-year-old whose grandmother got her 
those leather-bound collections of classics to try to encourage my love of reading, and I only ever read Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Poe, and Jack London. At a probably far too young age, had read all of the Poe collection because it was the complete Poe, including stuff that you know. At nine, I was I or ten, I had no idea what the heck I was reading. So I thought I had read Fall in the House of Usher, and then I came back as an adult, and I'm like, this is really short. Yes, this is this is much shorter than I ever realized. And or that I remember it, and also the narrator is uh, is frankly useless. Just yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like his his response to terrible goings on in the house is, "I'm going to read you poetry," <laughs> and then when <laughs> your dead sister uh, uh, turns out not to be dead and is uh, claws her way out of the tomb and comes in, and you scream and fall down. I'm not going to check anyone for a pulse. I'm just nope. going to scream and run out of the house. Yep, the and end. I, I'm like, <laughs> you're a lousy friend. And I'm, or if nothing else, like, okay, you clearly cannot keep your head in a crisis, which, all right, there, there are good people who scream and run away, but you should have gone back in the house and like tried to pull people out of the rubble if it's collapsing into the dark car, for God's sake. And also it was clearly about fungus. Like the, the entire opening is is just, fungus fungus there are horrible vegetable humors around the place there's more fungus it's uh, and i'm all there's a lot of fungus in this novel at whatever and also they never explain what is wrong with madeline and why she's buried alive and or what's what her ailment is and i'm going i feel there's a connection and i'm also the person who wants explanations for things like i always want to know how the magic trick is done when it came down to what is going on in Fall of the House of Usher, I'm like, I want to know what's going on. And, and yes, there's a lot to be said for ambiguity and horror, and, and I, I certainly will not argue the point, but I, I prefer to know exactly why things have gone, you know, terrible. And so I'm like, I want to get in there with that fungus and figure out Madeline Usher's ailment and maybe have a narrator who is not so completely useless. And uh, what was one thing and another, I uh, wrote What Moves the Dead. I'm extremely grateful that you did. So, of course, I had to go, same. I, you know, you kind of think, oh, yeah, I, I read Poe. You know, you, you, you've read it. And then I read, I read What Moves the Dead first. And that's when I was like, I don't, did I read this? Like, I kind of remembered it. But then it was, you know, one of those things where, is it just that it was told to me or is it part of, you know, it's part of culture? It's a cultural like, do I just, gestalt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do I just know it from that? So, you know, I went back and I, you know, looked it up and were, and I was just like, oh, I think I have some, yeah, same thing, like some leather bound pal. And I was, I was shocked at how short it was. And I, and I yeah. you know, that, 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 that's it. And, and I know you've, you've talked about sort of like this uh, economy of storytelling and, you know, there's something to be said for, sh for short stories and horror and whatnot. But I, I laughed because I, I do, I love author notes. So I read your author note. Um, and a lot of the things you said kind of, you know, it, it also very much encouraged me to go to really go back and, and read it because I was kind of laughing, particularly about when you you were talking about Poe and how he was really, really into fungi and how he devotes, uh, I think he wrote more words to fungal emanations than he does to Madeline. Which, and again, yeah. it's a short, it's a short story. So that's, that says a lot. Um, and again, I didn't remember, I, I didn't remember any of this until, you know, you kind of said it. And then along with reading it, uh, again, sort of sent me down this very bizarre uh, gothic medicine rabbit hole. Um, once you oh, start yeah, going, like was... getting into like the fungi and anyway, so thank you for that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll now never be able to look at mushrooms uh, in the same way. Oh, ever if you again. ever want to go down a rabbit hole, uh, uh, medieval cosmetics will take you terrifying <laughs> places. Okay. So like, you know, late at night when I can't sleep, that that'll be the, my next on my on my next Google on my to to Google list. Apparently, one of the uh, the sources of income for hangmen was selling fat from the corpses to uh, 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 cosmetic makers because they would use it as a base to like fill in because people had pock marks because they had been ravaged by the plague and occasionally syphilis, and it was it was a filler. Makes sense. Yeah. Filler. So the so the original fillers. This is like going yeah. back, you know, think about <laughs> injections and Botox. It's like this, it all comes back. It all, it all, you know, it's all full circle. Um <laughs> so getting back to fungi. What kind of uh mycology research did you do while either like before or while you were writing it or 
Oh, it was a lot of it was while while I was writing it. Most of the time, I am writing pure fantasy or mm-hmm. I am writing contemporary horror. Yeah. Uh, writing historical is hard because I was constantly stopping and because uh, uh, What Moves the Dead is set in 1890 something, uh, deliberately somewhat ambiguous something. <laughs> and so I was like digging through things going, when was it discovered that there was fungus that hunted nematodes? Can my my mushroom hunter actually say this or would anyone actually know that? And so even though I, I basically uh, cooked up how the fungus worked and how it was intelligent with the help of, of some lovely people on Twitter, it's all done with like biofilms and macro algae and, and electrical conductivity and crenellation brain like, and I'm like, None of that can go in here because they don't have the vocabulary. It's tough. Whenever I, I, I've written a couple other things that uh, aren't published yet, they're historical. And I spend half of it with Google open going, OK, when was this? T- OK. And then you're down a rabbit hole for, you know, 30 minutes so that you can write one sentence. Exactly. It's fun because I love that sort of thing. But yeah, it, it, it takes a while. I love when people talk about opening lines or like first like first, you know, like what kind of grabs you. So I love basically your opening sentence in this book is the mushroom's gills were the deep red color of severed muscle, the almost violet shade that contrasts so dreadfully with the pale pink of viscera. Like it's just so instantly kind of brings you in and brings that sort of the mushroom and the gore and then this cover, which I need to- Oh, that cover. I know, Jesus. I bought the original painting. Like I, they, they showed me, uh, uh, this is Christina Brozic and, uh, yes. uh, Brozic, and I was like, is the original available? And my editor's like, I'll, I'll put you in touch. And I'm like, just just tell me how much it is. I, <laughs> I, royalties for mo- what moved the dead have not come in yet, but I will buy, I said, let me give you my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> this is just stunning. And then again, that opening line, it just immediately draws you in and the mushrooms and the again, again going back to I'll, I'll, as a vegetarian, I'm deeply now <laughs> concerned. <laughs> I eat a lot of mushrooms, oh, and no. it, I, I sat and it made me think of like mushrooms are kind of weird, and like, but I guess you know you don't think about it, and then you know, obviously reading this, and and then oh yeah, they're their own kingdom. They're they're not you know they're not with us. <laughs> um, no, right. And so I had a few years ago um, read another book, a, amazing gothic, because gothics are some of my favorite. Uh, it's one of my favorite genres to to read, uh, which was Mexican gothic. And I was so I'm reading I'm reading your book, and and it's just so crazy because I felt like I I had read Mexican gothic, and then every time it was almost you know like the, I, I don't know if, if maybe because I was searching it but I was getting all these articles on like mushrooms and how they talk to each other and all these just crazy stories and, and I would be like you know my friends would be sending them to me and I'd be sending them to my friends who I also knew had read the book and it was just it was just you know one of those books that you couldn't you couldn't stop talking about and then I kept on you know more more layers things would come about and it would make me think of this book and um, so now your book is now added into that this book is now going to be added into that <laughs> well as as you you got from the afterward i'm sure uh, i was ha- i was like halfway through it and then read mexican gothic and very nearly just abandoned what moved the dead but like, <laughs> do i have anything to say that sylvia moreno garcia did not say better and uh if i had not sort of kind of sold the book uh which made it kind of imperative to finish and also uh <laughs> there is uh, at least in retellings uh, particularly uh, uh, authors will be like when we are having a dark night of the soul uh, I don't want to retell Beauty and the Beast because my friend over here did it better. And then usually that friend will chime in and say, yes, but you haven't done it yet. And if you give, you know, uh, 10 authors an idea, you will or you will get 12 different books. Exactly. Uh, so I was like, if I picked it up again. And, and partly the narrator I just wanted to spend more time with because I really enjoyed being the the Alex Easton, the narrator of the book. And so... Uh, yeah, I, I was I like, no, my mushrooms are different. You were talking about uh, how one of the other reasons you wanted to sort of explore um, the the House of Usher was is, is characters, and so and and, I, and I'm very excited to talk about characters. So, you know, we've got uh, in, in House of Usher, you have you so you have your narrator, who we've we've kind of gone over. You've got uh, Roderick, you got Madeline, and that's pretty much it. Um, but in, and Madeline your... is barely a character in, in the original usher. She's 
she's a, a name and a monster more or yes, less yeah exactly and so but but with you and your <laughs> and your version um so you've gifted us with with quite a few more uh personalities and i'm gonna say uh i just gotta say it while uh eugenia potter is 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 my personal favorite uh for right now i want to chat about i want to chat about alex easton um who is our sort of our non-binary narrator um and what what I thought was just so fascinating uses uh, their home country of uh, is it Galicia? Uh, I, Galicia and Galicia it's made up. Uh, yeah, yes. I, I went the Ruritanian route and just made up a couple of small European countries that uh, don't exist. Yeah, but but of course I was like it could I'm like it's just a, it could be Galicia with another L like but I was like or it could be like a made up it, either way love per, I love it because. So in there, in, in that country, they, uh, so pronouns, uh, so use, you know, the pronouns of that country instead of English ones. Um, and as a soldier, Alex's pronoun is, is ka. Um, and you explore the sort of use of pronouns based on responsibility. But you can use they because we're speaking English and that is how Alex would translate it. So don't yes. worry about trying to get it yeah. right. In the, in the, yeah. um, but just this, this idea of using pronouns based on responsibility rather than gender, which, uh, like kind of was just like, psh, like that was just fascinating to me. But so what drove you to, to explore the narrator in, in this way? I mean, Easton is uh, by far is, is fabulous. So I, I, I <laughs> but when you were like, I wanted to stay with, with Easton, I, I totally get it. But yeah, just what, how was that formation? Uh, well, I came up with that uh, in actually some fantasy novels I wrote. Uh, the World of the White Rat uh, is, is a series of fantasy novels that I, I self-published. And uh, there is a there was a species in there who uh, these sort of little badger people and their pronouns were uh, based on what uh, caste they were and not gender because I was thinking for some reason why why would pronouns relate to gender they could they usually just are they they give you a a marker of the person and many uh, uh, languages don't have gendered pronouns or a fair number of yeah. them or have uh, so I was like. I think I'd probably been reading uh, the ancillary justice books as well, which are a fabulous science fiction series where, uh, among other things, instead of he is the generic, they just make she the generic pronoun. And it's uh, it, it is it, it is very effective. And you go through it uh, basically not knowing what gender 90 percent of the people are. And uh and also a, a friend who's Finnish. And I think Finnish does not uh, have an automatically gendered pronoun. Although I could be wrong with that. And so I was just thinking about that. And uh, it, so I sort of had that idea in my back pocket. And uh, I was also thinking of uh, uh, writers have brains like magpies. And uh, I, you know what it's like, you're going down the rabbit research, you know, and, and having fun with that. And ages ago, I had uh, read about a, uh, a group of people in uh, the Balkans, in I believe in Albania is where they mostly live now, where uh, the, they had developed this, what I thought was the most fabulous workaround to the fa like women could not inherit property. And that was not a law that they could change. But because they, uh, uh, like many people in, in many cultures, uh, tended to have fairly high attrition among uh, the uh, young men because of, of a lot of uh, intergroup uh, violence. They uh, were like, okay, but uh, what if we just make more men? So they, you could uh, take an oath and if you were born female and you were now a man and that was it. You could just swear an oath and uh, for all intents and purposes, you are now male, you can hold property uh, you can engage in blood feuds and whatever. It was never treated as a gender identity issue among them, uh, possibly because, you know, uh, this this practice was largely uh, started centuries ago and that was not uh, nearly as much thing. It was a logistical one. And so you would have mothers who were widowed and didn't have any sons and are like, OK, I can't have a household. I can't own property. I have to go live with my in-laws and that's going to suck, but I have a daughter. <laughs> and so they, there are these reports of mothers begging their daughters to become sons so that they don't have to go live with their in-laws. And they would be like, yes, okay. And swear the oath. And at that point, you're a dude. It is, yeah. it is you, you have all the rights and responsibilities. You are not treated any differently. Uh, here's your sword and have fun. 
And so that was, was and the thing is, uh, uh, while uh, this is certainly not, uh, uh, Alex's culture is not a version of that in uh, Galatia, soldiers uh, amount to a third sex, more or less. They get a, they get a second set of primaries as an honorific. Yeah. But it was the 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 practical workaround of it that I loved. The uh, and so it was like, well, we need soldiers, and uh, traditionally only men have become soldiers, and we knew that. But we're really running low, and somebody just showed up, and all the paperwork says their pronouns would be con and con because that's what soldiers are. So, I. Uh, yeah, just give them a rifle and, and put them on the front lines and we'll worry about it after the war is over. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was how I got there. And uh, at Easton was just so much fun to be because uh, in many ways, they're a, a, a turn of the century European uh, veteran and they are prejudiced against Americans in sort of a hilarious fashion. Yes. <laughs> and, which I get to say because I'm American, damn it. So I, I, I had a lot of fun making jokes at, at our expense. And there's a lot of, you know, the the rough uh, put on, that sort of puts on a pith helmet and stomps off to meet Dr. Livingston attitude. But they're also, you know, they have shell shock, they're tired, uh, but they're just fun. <laughs> yeah, no, and I kind of loved as the horror was there, it like um, had like a, a little bit of levity. Like it brought this sort of this this humor, these relationships that they had, which was which was just fantastic. I, I can't sustain a serious serious for longer than a short story. Like all of my books inevitably become uh, people are like, "This is horror," but it's so funny, and I'm like, "Yeah, I I it, I, I don't really have a choice." <laughs> no, and that was that, that's I, I feel like a little bit of your 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 trademark. I, like I was I was sort of expecting that that, hu that humor, and then yeah, you know, and but again, you know, you start reading it, and you're like, "Oh, this is this is getting a little," you know, like this is this is there's a lot of like yeah, that that creep factor, and then but then sure enough, there it was you know that that sort of that wit. I'm gonna go back because I need. Uh, just like you needed to explore the story and you needed more, I need to know more about Miss Potter. So this this sort of fictional aunt to Beatrice Potter, which sort of was like psh, in its own way. Um, I need to know, is she is she ever accepted to the mycology society? I, I uh, need, do her I and Angus get together? Uh, I just feel like <laughs> there's a lot of things I need uh, to know. I feel well, like we're coming... <laughs> We're coming back to your. We're coming back full circle to your sort of children's authors or horrors authors comment right now. You know, uh, 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 Beatrix Potter wanted to, it was great love was mycology, and I I actually looked to see if I could uh, use Beatrix Potter in her youth, but I was off by like I would have had to set it in the early 1900s, and I and there would have been a world war on, so I was like. Eh. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that won't work. So I'm gonna have to make a great aunt who is just talking, you know, about how her her niece is is so enthralled with mushrooms. Um, uh, realistically, probably not, because uh, Beatrix Potter couldn't make a go of it as mycologist. So, uh, which is part of the reason she went to uh, children's books. And uh, I, I admire her greatly. She was an amazing woman. Uh, she is the reason that a lot of farmland was saved from developers because. Yeah. She uh, basically was writing one children's book a year to fund her land conservation and keep things as working farms. She saved a, uh, a breed of sheep pretty much from extinction. She probably won't be accepted into the Mycology Society. Her and Angus, I suspect, however, uh, have a, a bit of a, a, an item before them. I, I have toyed around. I'm working on the second Easton novella. If there is ever a third, I suspect uh, Miss Potter will will return in it and uh, we, we may spend some time in Galatia. And uh, it, I, I've only written the beginning, which is basically Angus saying, we are going back to Galatia and he used to be like, I, I don't want to go to, back to Galatia. It's cold and there are wolves. And uh, Angus be like, nope, uh, Miss Potter wants to look at the mushrooms there. So we're going and I have volunteered your house. And so, yeah. And then go and go. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Yes, I, I would be, I would be if you if you wanted to write any 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 sub short Angus Miss Potter <laughs> romance. I'm I'm just saying that uh, I, I don't know how many of them how many of us there are out there, but I am I, I am in personally. <laughs> this year is, is a little has been busy. You gifted us so we've we've had our uh, fantasy fairy tale esque nettle and bone. Now we have this uh, 
amazing uh, horror, gothic horror retelling, uh, What Moves the Dead. So uh, what's next? Other other than the Easton, the, my, my Angus, Miss Potter uh, romance novella. Uh, what, <laughs> uh, well, I'm, uh, uh, I'm hoping to self-publish another book between now and the end of the year because, you know, I, I have it there, so I probably should. Uh, but uh, in Jan- uh, not Jan- March, March, we have a horror novel called A House with Good Bones that uh, uh, will be coming out. And then uh, next summer, we will have another novella. And this one's a fantasy novella, so I'm sort of reversing the, the order. But yes, uh, there is, there's a lot more coming out. Uh, and I am currently working on the next Easton novella which uh, uh, involves poor Easton is actually in America and everyone is shaking hands with them. And oh, no. poor Easton. Yeah, they're just like, oh God. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, I, I'm having a lot of fun with that. It, it's it's kind of hard occasionally to knuckle down and do the horror bit because I'm just having so much fun having him get to the site of the horror. <laughs> but I think that's... Says, yeah. And I, but I, I do, and I feel like that's something I very much, um, I very much enjoy in your in your writing is that, uh, it, it, and it almost makes it, it almost makes the horror more so, you know, because you're kind of, uh, you know, you 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 get that laugh, or you're, you know, it almost like eases you up a little bit, and then it's like, <laughs> well, it's the we horror have, movie thing, you know, yeah, like, like oh, the, well, the, we have the, right. the music ratchets up, and then there's the the music sting, and then it's the cat, and you're like, oh, okay, thank God. And then the serial killer's right behind you. you know? yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, very well done. Um, yes, and then yeah, and then, like I'm just I'm just thinking of all the, the, again the imagery, which I think is so well done here with the with the fungi and the white hairs and the 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 white you know coming out of the fishes. And I don't want to give away too much for those who haven't read it, but it it's just like you sit there and you're like <laughs> as you're reading it. My last question for you. I am a firm believer that we are what we read. So I love, instead of, you know, almost asking someone to you know to describe themselves or talk about themselves, I love to just ask people what they're currently reading. Because I feel like that's a little bit of like a window into, into who we are. I just finished up uh, The Angel of the Crows by Kathleen Addison, and, uh, which I loved. Uh, uh, Catherine Addison, I think. Uh, yes, uh, who wrote The Goblin Emperor. And uh, so it is it is this marvelous sort of, uh, Sherlock Holmes adjacent kind of thing, except instead of Holmes, you have a an angel named Crow who solves murders, and it is it is a lot of fun. Uh, it is London with uh, some uh, with a lot of supernatural things. There are you know werewolves and whatnot, and uh, Jack the Ripper is on the loose. I'm not going to say it's nice because obviously people are getting dismembered all over the book, but it's a lovely story. It's a lovely story. <laughs> It's sweet. Like so many of the people are are just trying very hard and doing their best, and uh, it's it's nice. You can tell uh, a lot of it is motivated in sort of uh, uh, the fix fic desires that I think many of us have, which are okay. Uh, the sign of the four has a lot going on, but also it is horribly, horribly dated and racist. How can I fix this? And yes. uh, or this was just a terrible idea, and but I can fix it. And I, I enjoyed that enormously, partly because I had uh, just played uh, the Phoenix Wright Attorney at Law uh, games on, on the Switch, and they're, they've just put out one that is set in uh, where you're a Japanese lawyer in Holmes' England, you're an exchange student, and it's, it's hilarious. Uh, and bizarre and uh, uh, a lot of fun. I play a lot of video games. So that, and then uh, for the uh, the thing that you would probably not expect, I uh, uh, just recently reread Louis L'Amour's The Haunted Mesa. And uh, Louis L'Amour is not an author I generally read, but The Haunted Mesa was his int- attempt to write a science fiction novel. Yeah. And or or sort of horror science fiction, and a lot of it is is frankly okay. It's it, it, terrible, but <laughs> I had picked it up. Uh, I, I think I, I was like twelve, <laughs> and I uh, you know, we were on a long car ride. I had read all of my books. It was like you can buy a book at the supermarket, and this was the only one that had a. a it was all westerns except this one 
cover had like a kachina on it and i read the back and it's like okay there's a portal to another world all right i'll read that one and uh so i went back to uh to reread it because it it loomed very large in my brain as a kid and uh uh wow there's there's just so much wrong you can't even uh, words cannot express but at the same time it's fascinating to see and, and I say this as someone who, you know, uh, if I could sell as many copies of a book as Louis L'Amour, then of any book, my <laughs> editors at the tour would, uh, would just be backing up his own truck of money to the door. But uh, you can see someone who does not write in the genre grappling with all of the, the uh, problems of just starting to write in a genre. Yep. And so uh, it's, it, it, is, it is rambling and awful, but a lot of it, it's like, okay, I see where you're trying to bring in your, to bring your regular readership along with you, kind of. So everything is sort of over-explained about five times. At the end of the day, it's uh, the Anasazi vanished because they went through a portal to another world, which is also where the Aztecs lived. And the they set up this bizarre society that is full of like labyrinths and mazes and traps and they have a weird god king who's gotten senile and also for some reason there are sasquatch and there are komodo <laughs> dragons there's so much going on and it's so bizarre and it doesn't hang together and, and in the afterward which uh, this is part of the the re-release of the the like louis lamore vault or something where they uh, have somebody writing about uh, uh you know his notes on it and whatnot or outtake scenes that didn't get in and the entire uh, end at that is is someone who uh, I think uh, his his executive the, the the person doing is basically saying yeah he had no idea what he was doing here and he had he had big <laughs> ideas and they weren't coming through and he very nearly scrapped the book but the cover art had already been done and he loved it and he was on like a deadline so finally he just gave up and did this and uh, which I appreciated the honesty if nothing yes. else ironically. Having quite recently, uh, uh, my last horror novel was uh, before What Was Dead was uh, The Hollow Places, which is about portals to another world. And so I spent a while reading about, you know, mysterious disappearances supposedly to other universes. And uh, I realized that I had heard of the steamship, the Iron Mountain, which supposedly vanished in the middle of the Mississippi from reading the, the book, The Haunted Mesa, where the, the Iron Mountain shows up. And I, so it is almost uh, as an unconscious homage uh, the Iron Mountain steamship, just, uh, the, the ruin of it, actually shows up in uh, in the hollow places. They uh, the heroine is hiding in it, being stalked by monsters, and who can hear thoughts. And so she is thinking very fixedly about fanfic, try to uh, uh, distract them. So <laughs> that's amazing. It all it all comes back. It all comes back together. <laughs> Even those books where you, yeah, you're like, this is terrible. They just, they lodge themselves in your brain. And Honestly, oh. I, I, I have been inspired by bad stories yeah. so often because uh, a good story makes you think, wow, that is amazing. Uh, I couldn't ever do that. A bad one is like, oh, I can fix that. That's amazing. Ursula, thank you. Uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, Nedlin Bone, our fantasy and what moves the dead. Our horror are out now. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off, where we recommend books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of What Moves the Dead. I'm Mark. And I'm Becky. We're coming to you from our Barnes & Noble store in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just jump right in. Uh, We are covering a horror book, which is one of my favorite genres i would say uh, yeah one of your least favorites <laughs> um <much. laughs> but i think you picked a good one so i'm gonna go ahead and dive right in um i actually picked a book that was recommended to me by katie in the columbus area so shout out to katie thank you for this recommendation uh this is a book called the initial insult by mindy mcginnis so this is another book that takes a spin on a classic poe tale um the cask of amontillado So this follows a character named Tress, who several years ago, her parents disappeared uh, while driving her best friend Felicity home. And cut to Tress in high school, 
She is living in basically squalor with her alcoholic grandfather. She's not doing very well. Yet Felicity is absolutely thriving and is absolutely estranged from Tress. And Tress is fed up. She never got the closure that she thought she was going to get from her parents, or let alone any answers about what happened to them. And she is determined to find out what happened. So she decides to pull some answers out of Felicity by um, sealing her up in a coal chute, brick <laughs> by brick, until the confessions come out. Um, Yowza, this is a gripper. Uh, Raw, for the YA audience, this is a very mature novel. Um, It's a slow burn suspense and, damn, a great revenge thriller. (laughs) Um, I highly recommend The Initial Insult. It is creepy and wonderful. Becky, do you have one for us? Wow. I do, but I don't know if it'll... I I don't know if I can match that. That That's pretty... Thank you, Katie, for that recommendation. (laughs) Whoa. Uh, jeez, and it's teen? Yeah. Ooh, okay. Well, mm. um, mine is, um, because I, as Mark mentioned, I am not a spoopy reader. Um, but, um, but I did find one, uh, book that is a mystery thriller, more in my genre. Um, and, um, but it features Edgar Allan Poe as a character. So, um, the book that I am talking about is The Pale Blue Eye. Uh, this is by Louis Bayard. It's actually becoming a movie at the end of the year. Um. Uh, with awesome. Christian Bale, so yes, uh, something to look forward to. Yay. But uh, it takes place in eight, in the 1830s um, at West Point, which is just fledgling at that time. And um, basically, what happens is a uh, a cadet is found uh, hanging, and um, it's not completely unheard of because there's a lot of pressure at West Point. So uh, there's not too much thought into it of just like it's an unfortunate circumstance. Except that the next day, when they go to uh, look at the body, someone has snuck in and has removed the heart. Ooh. Exactly. Awesome. And now things get interesting. <laughs> um, so um, the the heads at West Point, they don't want anything, you know, they don't want this kind of becoming a big thing and shutting down the academy. So they, uh, they go to a retired uh, police inspector who had some renown uh, and ask him to investigate, just take a look, see what he can find out. Uh, so when he's at West Point and interviewing the cadets, he meets a young Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, what's interesting about this is that Edgar Allan Poe actually was a, a cadet at West Point for a few months. So it does take that little nugget of, of true history, um, but then it certainly spins it. Um, this is just a really, really interesting thriller. It keeps you guessing. Uh, pretty much till the end. You're really kind of just going along for the ride and, and um, it just, yeah, keeps building. It's at a very methodical pace. So um, just if you, if you can take your time and just enjoy that, you're, you're going to really love this book. Um, what I loved about it also is that it's written in that same kind of feel of like Sherlock Holmes, um, Dickens, kind of that same feel. So um, if you like that kind of writing, you're going to enjoy this. And um, while most of the book is told from the police inspector's uh, point of view, there are some letters from Poe to the inspector that are in the book, and they feel very much like Poe really wrote them. So um, this is just, like I said, just kind of a a good spooky thriller, Um, maybe not as horror-esque as um, (laughs) as some people may like, but worked for me really well. And this is The Pale Blue Eye by uh, Louis Bayard. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent pick. Um, thank you all for tuning into Port Over, uh, especially for this episode because T King for sure is fantastic. <laughs> Very excited for the new book. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can follow us at Barnes and Noble. I am Mark. I am Becky. And you can follow our home store at BN Westchester. Thanks so much for tuning in. Happy reading. Happy reading. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. The show is available on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts.